Welcome everybody to this very first OpenShift Commons briefing of 2016. I'm Diane Mueller and I'm the Community Director for OpenShift and I'm really pleased to have with us today Pete Muir and a number of his colleagues and friends from um, the, the Container Development Kit or CDK project and we've been doing lots of work trying to improve the local container development experience and they're here to talk through um, their approach to it and hopefully get your feedback on it. So I'm going to let Pete uh, kick it off and as people join they can introduce themselves. Thank you, Diane. So um, the kind of the agenda for today is I'm going to spend about um, hopefully 10 to 15, maybe 20 minutes uh, talking through kind of what we see the problem to be, um, what the goals of the work that we've been doing is, um, and then kind of give you an idea of, you know, uh, in a little more detail about what we set out to do in order to meet those goals. Um, I'm then going to hand over to uh, a couple of colleagues who are going to give you um, a demo uh, of what we have so far. So I'll start by introducing myself. So my name's Pete Muir. Um, I work for Red Hat. I'm uh, the engineering manager at Red Hat for uh, developer tools. And um, with me, uh, we have a number of people from the team, uh, but in particular speaking are going to be Max Anderson, who is the architect and lead for uh, the tools that help uh, people build and deploy applications. And then Fred, uh, Bricon, who is the uh, who works on the OpenShift tooling um, inside uh, of Eclipse. Uh, we also have uh, a few other people who I'm sure will be contributing via chat um, and you know perhaps answering some questions at the end. So before we get started, you know I want to um, give everybody a sort of you know a kind of a, an idea of where we are in this journey. Uh, when Diane asked me to do this, uh, she was very clear that. You know, you guys like to hear quite a lot about what's coming up, that, uh, you know, what we show you can be pretty rough and ready. Um, but you'd really like to hear kind of an idea of what's coming up. So I'm very much, you know, we're very much here in that vein. We're very much here to say, look, this is kind of what we're working on. Um, I would describe what we have as sort of probably around alpha quality at the moment. Um, we're working hard to uh, move that into um, beta and beyond um, and, and through to GA. But, you know, it is, it is rough around the edges. But the goal is to show you kind of, you know, the direction in which we're headed. Uh, the team has been doing an amazing job of pulling it together. The first time we really managed to get an end-to-end -end flow um, on, this, on the demo that we're going to show you was a couple of weeks before Christmas. Um, and obviously the team was mostly off over Christmas. So, you know, I think we, we, we're going in the right direction. We've got really good velocity going in that direction. So, um, you know, I, like I say, you know, early, early adopters at the moment, but uh, I definitely encourage people to check it out. So with that, I'll get started. I'll try not to talk uh, too much and, and for too long and get on to the meat, which is the demo. So uh, if we could go to slide two, please. So I wanted to start with a kind of a, a, a quick problem statement. Um, we're the developer tools team, so we really care about making um, development, development of applications easier. We see containerized applications as probably one of the most important trends in application development in the industry for a very long time. Um, uh, because it, you know, because of all the well-known benefits of, of containers, uh, of Docker containers. But we also recognize that, you know, this is a new technology, and at times it's been really hard to actually build um, applications. Many of the kind of conveniences that we're used to um, when we've built applications to run on bare metal uh, kind of, you know, got lost in the containerization efforts. So, you know, it was pretty hard to get started with at times. And it was also pretty slow. There were some really long uh, turnarounds when you would have to, uh, you know, change your code, test it out, um, you know, or get, sorry, build it into the container, get the container running, and see those changes running. You know, that goes from, you know, so my background is with, with uh, Java middleware. So something like JWAS App Server, you know, when I'm running on bare metal, I can get a turnaround in, a, you know, two, three, four, five, ten seconds with the application restarting. If I'm doing that in a container, that can go up to minutes. We are really concerned about that because we know that the, the kind of the code debug uh, cycle that people work through needs to be really fast in order for developers to be productive. So the problem we're trying to solve is how can we make it easier to get started with so there's no barriers to entry? And how can we make it really uh, a really good environment for developers to work in? 
So if we want to go to slide three, um, our goals, like I said, pretty simple. Uh, it needs to be really simple for the scenarios that we defined, which is kind of this you know, getting started scenario. We focus very strongly on Java um, and on uh, JavaScript. Those are our two focus areas, um, and particularly focusing, I guess, on uh, kind of microservice apps um, written using, uh, using Java. Secondly, it's got to be really fast, so it's got to be really fast to write and debug code. Uh, so those, those are just the, the two goals we were trying to achieve with uh, trying to set out to, to solve with this work. So if we want to go to slide five, I now want to talk a little bit more um, about uh, what we've been working on and kind of you know, who the target audience is and, and why it might be relevant um, or why it's relevant to you. One of our, you know, one of our uh, guiding principles in the developer tools team is that um, you know, we're, we're quite opinionated about what we do. So we, tr we know that we want to produce a really productive, really good developer experience. But we know that you know, if we try and do that for everyone, that's going to be really hard to achieve. So we try to be really tightly focused on some particular types of users and some particular scenarios to try and really optimize for those. So the scenarios that we wanted to optimize for, in this case, were JavaScript and Java developers who are running Windows on their development machine and are deploying to a Docker-based environment such as OpenShift. And you know, we think OpenShift is definitely the best Docker environment to deploy to. So our focus as the Docker environment was on OpenShift. So that's the target audience, JavaScript and Java developers running Windows on their desktop, deploying to OpenShift uh, in production. So if we go to slide six, um, let me start to talk about what you get in the box when you download the work that we've been doing, when you get hold of the work that you, we've been doing. And you'll see this in the demo in just a few minutes. So we, in order to, you know, if you remember our goals, our goals, our first goal was simple. So we wanted to make sure that everything you needed to build your Java application or your JavaScript application was included in the box. And so for us, that meant we included JBoss Developer Studio, our IDE, um, OpenJDK, in order to be able to run the IDE running on your Windows machine. Um, we included the Container Development Kit, which gives you access to an OpenShift environment that's running on your local machine. We include Vagrant in order to get um, the, uh, the CDK up and running, and VirtualBox in order to run the virtual machine that the CDK runs in. This all comes in a single download, a single installer, and it runs, like I said, on Windows. So what, if we go to slide seven, please. So what scenarios is this optimized for? And this is where we come back to, um, well, both of our goals. Um, so it's, it's optimized for running JBoss Developer Studio and OpenJDK running on your Windows laptop, which then communicates with an OpenShift that's running inside a virtual machine, um, where you can interact with the life cycle. Uh, you can use the source to image capabilities, and you can interact also with it using the GUI and the CLI. And then we're looking at uh, applications which are running inside Docker containers, and we were particularly focused on EAP, uh, JBoss EAP applications, and Node.js applications. So if we go to slide eight, please. So why, why should anyone care about this? And I've kind of talked about this a bit with the goals, but let me just reiterate. Um, we wanted this to be really simple. We wanted this to be as simple as being able to do a Docker run, uh, CentOS Wildfly. Um, so we wanted this to be a single uh, installer, a single downloadable that you could get hold of. And then once you've got it, we want to offer you the, the ability to really quickly deploy your code and really quickly debug your code when it's running inside that Docker container. So what was our kind of, you know, uh, what was kind of our conceptual journey? How did we think, uh, what did we think the steps that uh, you needed to take in order to get started should be? Uh, and then you can judge us uh, when we do the demo on how well you think we've attained them. So if we go to slide 10, please. So we assume that you were starting with a pretty much a bare metal machine. So your first step is to install Windows. And our target really is Windows 7, 8, or 10 uh, running on your laptop. We can go to slide 11, please. The next step you need is to get a redhat.com account. And you need to be able to sign up for the $0 developer subscription. Um, and this $0 developer subscription is totally free uh, to anybody who wants to use our software for development. And the subscription uh, will contain the CDK, it will contain Atomic Host, it will contain OpenShift Enterprise, and JBoss Developer Studio, all the components you need to get started. This subscription isn't quite launched yet, which is going to make it um, 
somewhat hard to use uh, right today, but like I said, you know, we're, we're working on all of these items and getting all of these done. So if we go to slide uh, three, uh, slide 12, please. So having got your redhat.com account, the next thing you need to do is download and run the installer. So the installer will install um, the components we've talked about in the box, so JDK, uh, the Container Development Kit, Dev Studio, and OpenShift Enterprise. If we go to slide 13, the installer will then also ask you to enter your redhat.com credentials so that you can then uh, update uh, and run any updates and install any additional software that you need into the environment. Go to slide 14, please. The next step you need to do is to be able to start your development environment, run JWAS Developer Studio. Slide 15, uh, please. And then, obviously, you want to be able to use a sample application. So you have the ability to select from some common uh, applications, some common sample applications inside JWAS Developer Studio. And this should run straight away uh, in the local OpenShift environment that you're using uh, without any additional setup. And finally, of course, we want you to be able to change code and see those changes reflected quickly in your running application. So that was our goal. That was the kind of really what we set out to do, a really simple, easy uh, to get started experience, and then be able to see those fast code changes. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Max and Fred, um, who are going to take you through the demo um, and show you some of the, uh, show you how we've worked towards some of these goals and um, see how much easier I think we've made it uh, in order to get started um, with this local container developer experience. Max. Hi, thank you, Pete. So this is Max Anderson. As Pete said, I'm the architect behind the uh, deployment and, and coding in our uh, developer experience. Uh, in the past, I've been leading the developer studio uh, work. So if you've seen me talk about Eclipse plugins, um, that's what I've been doing the last uh, few years. Uh, but now we're going into more Eclipse tooling and, and, and beyond for this container tooling. So uh, I'll show the, in, the ah. installer. Yes. Uh, we can't see any screen. No one's showing it. At least a bunch yeah. of us oh. can't actually. Make sure I'm sure again. Yeah, yeah. There you. You're He's back. We're receiving okay. your presentation slides, but not your um, desktop. Okay, but uh, I'll I'll come to that in two Wait. seconds. Okay. Diane, we're not seeing the slides though either. Ah. A bunch of us are seeing the slides. Are we in? Is it supposed to be in blue jeans? It's in blue yes. jeans. Blue jeans. Right now there should be a video because I'm done mm -hmm. the... No, like Mark Borstein, myself, and Xavier, none of us see anything. Okay, let me. Uh, the I presentation think... is going out. Yeah. yeah, the presentation is going out. Um... It is? I haven't yeah. seen it. I mean, I see the video. I yeah. I haven't, I haven't seen anything. <laughs> Okay, okay. As, as far as I can see, people are saying they can see it. I, okay. You, you are the unlucky well, one, it looks like. <laughs> yeah, there's some of us that are unlucky. So just record, make sure that whoever is it's being recorded, and I guess we'll watch it later. Maybe it'll be available then. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry for that. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, um, I'll show the installer. Then I'll hand over to Fred for doing the, 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 the tooling workflow, and it'll come back to me. I'll summarize. Uh, uh, what was shown and some of the things that we couldn't fit into the demo or we haven't uh, polished enough to, to show off yet. Um, so again, uh, the idea, what you're seeing here, I'm, I'm showing a video of the installer because actually running the installer takes a bit of time because it is a, it's a rather big, big uh, download. I'll walk you through. So first of all, the, when you have the installer, uh, you'll have to log in with your username and password for the developer, uh, Red Hat developer account. And this is purely just to get access to the productized binaries like OpenShift Enterprise, the CDK that has a Docker and Atomic in it, uh, and the yeah, Developer Studio uh, in there. Um, so once you've logged in, <clears throat> it will, uh, of course, verify. If you haven't uh, don't have access, it will uh, tell you to to go and create them. So I just pause here for two seconds, and you'll see this is the first page of the installer. It has the OpenJDK. Uh, uh, V8 that will run on Windows, a Red Hat Container Development Toolkit, which is called CDK. So this is where we have Docker and OpenShift and a, a base OS uh, to run on your Windows machine. Um, then Red Hat Developer Studio, in this case, is version 9. 
which will have all the Eclipse tooling for doing Java E, JavaScript development, and now container uh, target development too. And then finally, inside will be a Red Hat OpenShift Enterprise. And it, if I go further, you'll see a little bit of details. It'll start downloading all these things in the, in the background. Uh, we also have installed, have everything bundled. It'll probably be a bit bigger. Um, but the idea is it will start installing like CDK, Vagrant, VirtualBox, JDK, JBS, and uh, Sequin in this case, which is to get stuff like rsync and SSH, which you need uh, to talk from your host, in this case Windows, to Docker and OpenShift in a, in a nice manner. Um, and I'm just going to fast forward because this will take some time and there's no fun in, in doing that. Uh, live. So once you're at the end and you're running on Windows, you get it in the folder here now called Build Platform. It has everything in it CDK, SIGWIN, JDK, Vacant, VirtualBox. And we put it there so it doesn't conflict with anything, just something to be able to run uh, on any machine. Uh, and the whole idea, as Pete iterated, is that all this is just kind of configured to work together. Uh, so the CDK works um, on its own, but the IDE is set up to um, be able to know where these components are and talk to them. Um, and that's the installer. Uh, I think, yeah. uh, yes, that's all the list to the installer. And now I'm just going to drop back and uh, hand it over to Fred, and Fred will continue from, from the Eclipse side. And then I'll be back in a few seconds. So over to you, Fred. And I'll stop sharing my screen, and you should be able to take it. All right. <clears throat> oh, I... Can you see anything? Yes, we can. All right. So um, I'm unfortunately not running Windows, but it's pretty much the same thing. Um, once you're inside JBDS, after the installer completed, um, the installer will have created something called a CDK server adapter um, that will be uh, shown in the service view here. So that CDK server adapter basically allows us to start and stop the Vagrant, uh, the Vagrant file that, that uh, starts the CDK itself. So once I start it, what will happen is it will um, spin up a, the OpenShift instance and we'll, we'll also be able to show the uh, Docker registry uh, inside, that, uh, inside the, the CDK. So let me just start it. Um, so the first thing it asks me is the uh, password for my Red Hat um, um, login. So typing it. Okay. And <clears throat> once it started, um, I will be able to see the there, the Docker Explorer, in the Docker Explorer view, I can see the CDK server adapter Docker registry that contains some containers running. Um, so this is basically the internals of the OpenShift instance that's running. Um, I can see containers, images, um, so a lot of things. So the Docker tooling allows me to, from that Docker registry, to pull images if I want. I could uh, search for wildfly images, for instance. Search them. Wild without a typo will be better. There you go. I can select the image, select the um, the tag I want to, to install and click finish and it will pull the image in my Docker registry. So yeah, the, the, this is basically the internals of the uh, OpenShift instance that I'm running from the CDK. So on the other side, in the OpenShift Explorer, you will see that I have a new connection to the open, local OpenShift instance provided by the CDK. So in that, in that instance, I have a couple projects um take and tag and my goal now is to to deploy a java e app onto openshift 
So this is my local cloud environment running on my laptop. So in order to do that, what I can do is pick any kind of project from the Jebla Central page, um, which allows me to access at least, say, 200 examples. So if I want to to create a REST, uh, a REST application uh, using the JaxRS um, framework, I can select, uh, for instance, Hello World RS, and it's loading the metadata. It will take a couple of seconds. And the uh, the wizard tells me that the this app runs on EAP6 or more or Wildfly, and it works best using the Maven C CDI configurator. So I will not complete the um, the process here because it takes uh, a few seconds, and I, I already already have it in my workplace. So this app is a Java E app um, using uh, REST endpoints um, and CDI as a dependency injection framework. So the the tooling that we provide allows you to quickly navigate through the REST endpoints. I can click on the um, Project Explorer view on these endpoints. I can uh, debug, run them on, on debug mode on server, for instance, here. Uh, there's a web service tester provided by JBS. I can click run or I can test the JSON endpoint. And the response body uh, outputs the, the results. So this is my Java E app. Uh, runs locally on my JBus, uh, local JBus instance. So now the goal is to run that same web app inside OpenShift. So how to do that? It's as simple as um, saying configure deploy to OpenShift. Now, <clears throat> in order to do that, so this is the uh, signing um, page to to OpenShift. You need your username and password. So now, in order to to deploy your app, there's a one uh, major prerequisite. Uh, this project needs to be uh, shared with Git so that the OpenShift instance knows where the source is, the, the source lives, and so it can clone the, the repository and build the, the sources. So I've done that before before creating the, uh, the um, after creating the project before the demo. Um, now that, that I have my selected project, um, because this is a Maven-based project, uh, it has a POM XML, the, the wizard will uh, filter the, the available templates uh, on OpenShift uh, using the EAP keyword. Uh, but I can um, select any other kind of, uh, of template if I want. So in our case, I'm going to just stick with the EAP64 basic S2I template. Um, it will, it's a template that basically runs the same uh, EAP server but on OpenShift. So here in the template parameters, I can see the source repository URL uh, points at my uh, personal um, repository on GitHub. I click next, finish. And the, uh, the application has been created on OpenShift. So in the tag, uh, oops. Refresh there. Demo gods, where are you? Okay, so in my tag project, uh, my EAP app is running. The build is running. So what I can do is open the build log, see what's happening, and I can see the um, the Maven app is being um, built. Uh, so it's going to take a long time, uh, about five minutes. Um, so, in the meantime, we can do some other things, probably. Um, <clears throat> we can take a look at uh, what the OpenShift Explorer provides. So, uh, we can see we can have access to build logs, but uh, we can also take another app, for instance, that one that's already deployed. 
and you show in web browser. And in that case, I have a Node.js app that's running on OpenShift on my local machine. Um, I can also show the same project uh, in the web console. So this is the OpenShift console. So if you're familiar with OpenShift, then you will be uh, you will be at ease here. Um, and another thing that we can do is um, edit some configuration. So in that case, my Node app uh, points at the OpenShift repository. So I want to change that to use my own fork. I can edit the build config and click uh, check the source change it to my fork save it and you will see the in the in the explorer the um, git url change to to use my own fork so i don't have it in my workspace but i can import my app that app in in, in my workspace and do import application. It should take a few seconds. There, next. Clone location, finish. And there, I took the uh, the sources um, from from the the app re uh, referenced in my my. OpenShift app and imported everything in my in my workspace. So, what's the status on my EAP app? Uh, build seems to be complete. Uh, pod is running. Pod log. So the server is is started. Uh, started in seventy seconds. So. Let's see if it's already running. Showing web browser. There it is. Um, okay, so that that's one way to to deploy the your your local project on OpenShift, but it takes a it takes a several minutes. Um, so the turnaround is not really exciting, but we can do better. Um, so I'm going to demo now how to get incremental deployment in a really, really much faster way using the Node.js app. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, pretend that I have a local uh, server for Node.js. So I'm going to create a new server. It's an OpenShift 3 server. Next, um, still selecting my my server, connect, my OpenShift connection, and so I select my project. Um, this is the source path of my project, and basically what's going to happen is we're going to do a R sync between the local machine and the remote pod on OpenShift. So my my service is Node.js. Finish. Uh, so my server is created. I can show in the web browser. Still running. Okay. So let's do some changes here in my index page. Okay. So we're going to change the title. Uh, hello, Earl. And publish. So it's publishing. It's done. And I, if I refresh it, the app has been refreshed. So it's much, much faster to work that way using the OCR sync uh, feature um, that's hidden behind that um, OpenShift. Um, server adapter. Uh, we can do even slightly better. Um, 
here I had to to refresh the the browser manually, but I can also open that that page in a live reload server. So basically, the live reload server acts as a proxy to the OpenShift server. So I got a see the URL here. I got a local URL, um, and every every time my browser um, receives a, a query, it will um, tra transmit the, the query to the server uh, on OpenShift. And every time I do a change, uh, a publish, every time I publish something on my server, the OpenShift, the, the um, Live Reload server will refresh the web page directly. So let's see how it looks. Now if I publish, there, it refresh automatically. So currently we need we still need to manually do the um, the publishing part, but uh, eventually we'll we'll do the automatic publishing as as soon as you save your file. So that that's a way to to get a much much better turnaround while developing your your app on OpenShift. Um, so we deployed our EAP app earlier. Um, if we look at the images on the Docker registry, uh, I can refresh them. And you can see the Docker, a, a Docker image has been added to the Docker registry, uh, matching my EAP app. Um, so that's about it, the, the current status of the um, OpenShift, Eclipse OpenShift tooling. Um, and back to you, Max. Thank, <clears throat> thank you. And I'm just trying to find the share screen again. There we go. And you should be able to see my screen again. Okay. Um, so, but Fred, so uh, good, uh, was uh, good to show. Um, was the Eclipse tooling? So I did first the all-in-one installer, that again takes all the bits you need for your uh, Windows machine and get it up and running. Uh, it saves you time. You don't have to spend time on setting up both Docker break and the whole, the whole shebang. Um, and then when everything is set up, it kind of just works. Not kind of. Yeah, Max, I can't a, hear you at the moment. You cannot hear me. Why can't you hear me? I, I can I hear, hear Max. you. Okay. So someone can hear me. <laughs> okay. I'll I'll go on. Max okay. I'll, I'll continue. Um, so uh, okay. everything just works. Um, the setup, uh, it, when you start up Eclipse, it will know about the VM you have running, uh, we installed. It will know about the, 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 the CDK, the vacant file that is used for starting it. It will know about the Docker and OpenShift that comes available when CDK starts up. And you don't have to set anything up inside Eclipse. Um, and then of course, there is the actual container tooling, so which uh, Fred showed, like for Docker and OpenShift, et cetera. Um, he also showed that we have a bunch of uh, OpenShift ready quick starts. If you use JBoss Developer Studio in the past or been on, on developer.jbus.org, you've seen these, some of these quick starts in, in the early form, uh, working on uh, both locally and OpenShift v2. Um, these are now being expanded also to cover uh, OpenShift v3. Um, beyond that, he showed to take one of these quick starts and load into Eclipse, meaning it was an existing Eclipse product that was not an OpenShift, but then take that existing product and deploy up to um, to an OpenShift instance. Now, in this case, running locally on your CDK. Um, if you know o OC the command line, this is similar to what OC New App does, but just in in an Eclipse setting. Um, but now where it becomes really interesting is the incremental deployment. So the, what he did show, what we have working now, is incremental deployment of Node.js. Uh, because as you noticed, the, the actual the first deploy of a Java E app 
might be a bit heavy, especially if you are doing the full Maven build, the full Docker, etc. Um, but so we wanted to spend some time on on making the deployment of Delta changes efficient. Um, so in OpenShift, there's a tool called OC Sync, uh, which allows you to incrementally do ch uh, take changes from your local file system up to uh, an OpenShift instance. And what Fred showed was uh, using that behind the scenes in our server adapter to do for a node node app. And then together with the node app, he had live reload running. So when he did changes in his IDE, they reloaded in his browser once they had published to the server. Um, and if you come from a local deployment, you go like, why is this interesting? Like we've been doing this for a while, but that's exactly what we're trying to do. Make sure that what you've been able to do locally, that you can do that um, on an OpenShift instance, whether that is the CDK locally here, where should, the, the turnaround should be decent, uh, or if it's in a, in a cloud where it might be a bit uh, slower because of, of, of network latency, et cetera. But anyway, anyway, the idea is the local OpenShift deployment you have, uh, you get um, almost instant feedback similar to what you have for local deployment via this incremental deployment using OC Sync. And then the library load that we've had for a while, but it's all integrated now in, in the IDE tooling and in OpenShift. Okay, so a few things that we didn't uh, manage to show you here, but we are either already have, but didn't couldn't fit into a demo or be planning. So one is the incremental deployment of Java EE. So again, we saw the, the rather slow first deployment of Java EE. We want to do the same thing uh, using a local build and an OC sync uh, over, so we can do the uh, Java class replacement, uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, etc. replacement. Um, but on top of that, if you know Java, sometimes we change classes. Uh, these changes doesn't take effect immediately. This is something that when we run locally, we can just kind of just restart the container and everything is fine. Uh, sorry, to restart the application container. Uh, but in the in a Docker scenario or in a Microsoft scenario, this might actually take longer uh, for some cases. So we've looked at integrating what we call hot reload of Java apps. So if you know things like Spring Reloaded or JRebel, that kind of functionality, we are uh, looking at embedding uh, into the tool set into OpenShift um, with a few things that is optimized for EAP. So you get the right, uh, you, you only get restarted the things you actually need. And again, this is all to make sure that when you change something on your in the development environment, you can see the chains fast without having to wait for too many redeployments. <clears throat> um, another thing is when you have Docker images, uh, you, might, you might have your own Docker image you have running locally or you have it on Docker Hub. Uh, you can also take these Docker images and deploy to OpenShift from the tooling. Um, even more is the um, one of the things that the big the the thing we we uh, we don't have yet but really wanted you to do is when you have this local setup in an OpenShift application running locally, how do I make that run on another OpenShift instance? Uh, but luckily, because we're using Kubernetes, this should just be about taking your application uh, and the descriptors in from Kubernetes and deploy it to another instance. So you want to make that easy too. Um, Oh, and I skipped one, sorry for that. Uh, another one we have is Java and Node.js debugging. Um, we have already today, you can port forward to, so when you're running in a, in a Docker container, OpenShift, there will be stuff that is you know shielded off for your local environment. Uh, we've made so our containers can be run with a certain flag, so they enable debugging, and then that the tooling can connect to it, uh, or any other Java debugger for that matter, can connect to it and and, you can do you can use a deb debugger as you used to, um, but we're also doing it for Node.js. And today, if you're running Node.js on OpenShift, uh, it will run uh, let's call it in production mode, meaning you'll have to restart the full container to see changes to your JavaScript. Um, but uh, you can do changes to HTML and CSS just fine, but not for the JavaScript code, which is kind of you know the thing you want to change when you do Node.js. Um, so we've extended the, the Node.js uh, containers on OpenShift to have, again, a similar flag we can set. So when you run a node, the Node application, uh, the IDE can uh, do OC sync. It will see a change, and it will restart uh, the Node.js container, not the whole setup, mean, meaning you won't lose, you don't have to wait for anything there um, on the OpenShift side. 
Okay. Um, so that's kind of the, the additional plant features. Um, another one is, you know, we focus very much on, on, on Eclipse in, in this presentation. Um, but if you don't use Eclipse, <clears throat> well, the great thing is that we all the tooling we actually showed Eclipse didn't use anything, you know, custom or specific. It was all using standard Docker protocols, OpenShift APIs, et cetera. And that means existing tooling out there, whether that is, uh, you know, Docker command line, OpenShift command line, OC, kube control, all that stuff, you can run on your Windows instance um, and connect to the to this uh, to to the CDK. Um, there is a a, a Vagrant plugin plugin called Vagrant ADB Info, which will dump out the information that is necessary to set up these command line tools. So if you try things like the Docker machine or um, Vagrant Box that that this works in the same way. You just get these environment variables, which then other tools can can use and connect to. So if you are a non-Eclipse user or a command line user or IntelliJ or something else, and they have similar tooling, this will work with it too. Um, and finally, the CDK is basically a little pre-configured Linux VM, meaning you can do Vagrant SSH into it, and then you can you know access it as you want as a in a Linux mindset if you want that for you. OK, um, so how to try this out now? As Pete said in the beginning, uh, this is kind of alpha quality. Um, there are some parts that is there now, especially the, the Eclipse tooling that uh, Fred was showing. This is all something you can try today. Use that against existing Docker, existing OpenShift uh, tool, uh, instances. The part that is not in a easy to download available today thing is the, um, the, the CDK packaged in a way that uh, has OpenShift in it. Um, which, but you can get the source for it. It's all on github.com, Red Hat, that's the little that's tooling, OpenShift Vagrant, uh, as is on the slide. And then finally, the whole installer, uh, also the source code for that is uh, available. It's actually an Electron app if you are interested in that kind of thing. I just want to just point out that currently the downside of these builds is they depend on binaries only available inside Red Hat right now, but it can give you an idea of what you're working on. And we will uh, update these repos. And th this is actually our master repos, so you can see what we're working on um, and give feedback once these things come out. OK, and that actually brings us to the end. Not sure if Pete have any final comments. Uh, no, I don't have any comments. Um, I just want to say thank you very much to both Max and Fred for a really good demo. That was um, really informative for me, uh, definitely. So I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. It was definitely informative, and, and it really, um, you guys have made a lot of progress since the last time I saw this, probably November um, last year. So it looks really um, very interesting. If if people want to give feedback. Um, it, what's the best method for them to do that? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so we have uh, on the slide, there's a, a DevOps Developer Studio forum. Um, you can post questions there. Uh, and otherwise, on Twitter, we are on DevOps Tools, and you also listen to questions on the at OpenShift. Okay. So you pretty much one of the questions I was going to ask you was what are the new features that are coming? And I think you covered that off in the last couple of slides. So thank you for that. There was um, an earlier question um, by Marcus, but I think you also I'm going to unmute him and um, around the dependency on GitHub. Um, but I think we covered that off as uh, well. I saw one. I saw a question about why we don't allow the product to be mounted from the product to be mounted from your host, the laptop workspace, into your OpenShift container, so you don't have to commit to the Git repo and redeploy every time. Um, so this is actually, I, I can answer that in a bit more detail than I did on the on the chat. Um, so basically there's two parts here. One is what you suggest there, Mark, is, is perfectly doable, especially in, in, in a Docker world where the Docker is running in um, on your in machine. You can do what's called a mount, mounted volume. Um, the downside currently is that if you're running on Windows, Doing mono, volume, mono shared volumes is actually not very fast, and there's some tricks to it. But you can actually do it. As well, if uh, I can, maybe add a few uh, comments to the slides. Uh, some blogs we did uh, uh, six to eight months ago 
about how to actually do that from the tooling today. Um, so you can do that in a Docker scenario. When we do f go to OpenShift, we'll be actually running in a cloud where there's a, a cloud-like environment. Um, there'll be multiple parts that might need to be synchronized to. It's not just a single place. Um, there is network stuff that might not be easily available for us. Uh, and that's why, as uh, Fred showed and I talked about, we use this thing called OC Sync, which will basically take, it'll use our sync behind the scenes to take an efficient delta and copy over to, to the container. Um, and that basically does the same trick. So you don't have to do the git commit, et cetera. Um, so I hope that answers the question that why we not, or rather, why we doing more than just mounting the volume. I'll also add that maybe from a kind of a higher level perspective, I think this, so the problem that we're talking about here, right, is how do we get the files from the person's local workspace into the application, right? That's the kind of a fundamental problem we're trying to solve. And how do we do that quickly? And I think we recognize that that is a real problem that, that definitely needs solving. Um, that was a part um, of the original brief for this initiative that we've been working on here. Um, it's still something I think that we need to um, address better, whether it's done best by mounting volumes or by running you know, a Git server locally that people can you know, push and pull from. Um, I think there's multiple ways to solve that problem of how do you get files from the workstation and up into OpenShift. I think you know, both you know, we and the OpenShift team all recognize that this needs to be uh, much easier than it is today. It needs to be sort of pretty much transparent and quick. Um, but I, I don't think we've really focused or fixed on a particular solution um, today. I think there's a, a variety of solutions that we could, could look at. Okay, there is yeah. one last question here. Um, uh, Peter Larson is asking, is Tomcat supported as well? Uh, so the stuff we've shown works too uh, on a Tomcat setup. So this will work with the Tomcat like uh, Tomcat uh, OpenShift support image. Okay. All right. So let me again just come in briefly on that to explain our philosophy. And I talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but our philosophy is kind of we optimize for certain scenarios. We support certain scenarios as a company, as Red Hat supports certain scenarios, right? And then there are other scenarios that are, are possible. So for us, kind of that EAP path um, and the Node.js path that Max and Fred showed, that's kind of our optimal path. That's the one we're really focused on, in on, um, kind of laser focused on. There are others that we definitely support, um, such as the Tomcat one that was just mentioned. Is that the one that we spend most of our time you know, and we really push the QE team to make sure they're really doing a great job of testing that. Is that the one we show in demos? Is that the one we, you know, document the hell out of? No, but it should still work. Uh, it, it does still work and we still support it. And then there's things that are possible, right? So things that should work and maybe you have to do a little bit of fiddling to get them going, but, you know, they should work in there. So, you know, I guess, I think from my perspective, it helps to sort of always keep that philosophy in mind. Um, and that explains why we always show particular paths through the tools. Mm -hmm. And we've got another couple of questions. Um, Ramon is asking, how about monitoring with JMX and the container? Any way to connect mission control or something similar to the pod? So I can answer that. So the simple answer is yes, you can do that. <clears throat> uh, it requires, currently it requires you to, you basically just have to have port forwarding. Uh, they are, it requires two parts. You have to port forward uh, to the container and the container has to expose that port. Um, so you can do it manually today. Uh, we actually have uh, kind of mission control like features in DevOps tools that I would like to enable uh, in this fashion. Um, but currently it's a manual process, but you can do it. I hope we can get find a way with um, a talk with the OpenShift team that we can actually, because we're running in a local environment, uh, we can do a bit more tricks than a, in a full blown OpenShift. Um, so we can basically do a, a, what's called a Docker exec behind the scenes to open up these ports. Um, but this is just this is just kind of ideas. But in, technically, it is possible. But right now, it's a manual process. There was one last question: um, How much resources are used by the CDK VM CPU and RAM? And Brian, so I think it? yeah, Brian answered. Uh, I even I think even the one we are using right now, we're actually using less. It's like one and a half gig we've set up, 
and two CPUs. Um, but yeah, it, it, we have a default right now. We haven't tuned it, but yeah, it'll be somewhere between one or two or three. But the idea is you can you can uh, we'll have a default and you can override it if you want to, depending on your you know experience, what kind of large application you want to deploy. Let's see. Let's give it a minute or two. That was almost a full. Any template tooling on scope? Any template to I I I don't understand the question. That one. So, in Ramon, you want to clarify that? I think that's he's referring to Kubernetes OS. Ah, for building a template. Okay. Um. So the um. So we don't have specifically like template tool, like advanced uh, tooling plan in this area. Uh, but what we, what we have recognized is we're going to add, um, uh, uh, we are working on adding a JSON editor to uh, the Eclipse base, uh, which allows us to have content assist and uh, basic validation based on JSON schema. Uh, that alone will get be, become a bit nicer to, to edit. If you notice the editor that uh, when um, um, Fred was uh, editing the config, that was actually a syntax highlighter editor. So that's kind of the, the precursor of this JSON editor. Um, but the fact we can add the JSON schema to it means stuff like content assist becomes better. And we are working on making that extendable so we can add like OpenShift specific logic to, to aid the, the user there. Um, but that's about it at the moment. But uh, yeah, I, it's something we discussed, but not nothing specific beyond what I just mentioned. Okay, and, and the one thing that everybody always asks for, you have a roadmap, what is available today and six months and later. Um, and I had also asked earlier if, if there's a Trello card tracking some of these things um, that you could share. Yes, so uh, there is a Trello card, Pete, will add, we'll add it to the at the end of slides here. Uh, more specific roadmaps. Right now, it's a bit spread out. I'm not sure if if Pete knows anything, um, but right now it's it's spread out between JBDS and uh, the the CDK uh, area. But yeah, you have so, the Trello. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, we don't have. Uh, so we're still, as you can see, working on uh, getting this right. Um, I don't have a sort of set of dates that we can give at the moment, unfortunately. Um, that's one of the things we need to work on is a set of dates. But, uh, you know, this is, as you saw, this is made up of a number of different components. Um, quite a few of those components are, you know, released reasonably frequently. So things like the JBDS support. I mean, Max, you, you can definitely talk about when the JBDS support for some of the features that we saw today would be going GA. Um, as for uh, the CDK uh, GA release date, I don't have, we don't have that uh, immediately available at the moment. And I believe the OC sync support is in uh, OpenShift 3.1. Yep. Yeah, correct. So uh, yeah, the, the GA of the, the tooling we showed today will be in March. Um, that's the, the plan. And then we will start doing more uh, over the summer. And uh, yeah, those those dates and uh, times are in our, our JBDS Jira. You can set links for that. Yeah. And there was a question about <clears throat> Do you have integrated VirtualBox into your solution? What about auto virtualization tech like VMware? Uh, so this is a fun one um, <laughs> in the sense that uh, yeah, we had to take a pick of which one we want to put in there. And right now, VirtualBox was the one because it ran on, on it was the easiest to get uh, going with for us and having in distribution. Um, and I think uh, the CDK itself supports VirtualBox and one more, but uh, yeah, Brian says libvirt. And others on Horizon. Uh, for this scenario here, I think if there's one we would target after this, it might be hypervisor for Windows, because we've if you run the the people who are running Windows that has hypervisor can actually not run VirtualBox. Um, so that's the fun of that. Um, so the answer is right now we're doing VirtualBox, but we will probably do something more in the future. Which ones is undecided? I'll add to that that um, what. What we showed you today was kind of we focused on that that what we think of as the main path through the installer, which is getting all of the core tools installed for someone who doesn't have them already. One of the uh, enhancements we need to do as we go through the beta phase is adding the ability to 
um, select existing components that you might already have on the system, um, and also allowing people to you know, use things like other hypervisors. So the CDK supports a number of different um, virtual machines. Um, so we, we want to be able to make sure that we can um, you know, allow that to be selected during the install process. If you if you already have them installed, I think that would be the key thing, right? We're only if we if you're using our single download single installer, we're gonna the one we're gonna be able to install for you would be VirtualBox or possibly Hyper V in the future or use Hyper V in the future. If you've got other ones already installed, we we need to be able to uh, you know, as a feature request for the installer, we need to be able to make sure that you can select the one that you want to use. So Pete and, and everyone else, thank you very much for um, today. Uh, are, if, if people from the community want to get involved in helping testing or adding new features, um, what's, what's the best way for them to do that? Again, so I would suggest going to the um, GitHub repositories that we have linked from the slides. We're pretty active in the issue tracker there. So there are often long discussions on the, on, on the issue tracker. We have quite a few uh, contributors from Red Hat. Um, who jump in and help out with, with getting things done there. So that's a great way to follow along, I think, on both of those GitHub repositories that, that Max linked, you know, following the pull requests, following the issues. Um, that's probably the best way to get involved today. Awesome. So, um, and otherwise, we, we, we are also in all the regular RSC rooms uh, on you know, Freenode, like OpenShift, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, OpenShift and OpenShift-Dev are, are very good places to... Yeah to ask questions and to give suggestions. So, but tracking them through the issues is pretty, pretty cool. And Brian's just said for the CDK on Freenode, join um, Atomic and I'm gonna say it wrong, Nucleo. Um, Nucleo. Nucleo. Nucleo, Nucleo uh, there. So yeah, there's, there's lots of places, places there. Um, and we can all, we can all help you get to the right funnel to get the feedback in. So thank you very much to everybody for um, coming today. Uh, I look forward to when you go GA and have some more new features to showcasing it again. Um, and again, thank you, Peter, for, for joining us from that hotel room, wherever you are, um, and everybody else who's joined. It's, it was very enlightening, and I'm looking forward to being able to demo this myself next time. All right, take thank care. You. And the recording will be up. Next week's session will be on uh, an, an Atomic and OpenShift update with Mike McGrath and members of the product management team from OpenShift. So that should be fun too, so stay tuned. Thank you.